This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Energy in America today on a given Wednesday at 3 p.m. And we're talking, as we always do, with Lou Pugliarisi. He is the CEO of EPRINC, which is a, an energy policy research uh, think tank in Washington, D.C. He joins us by Skype, and we always like to talk to him and catch up on what's going on. Lots is going on. Hi, Lou. Welcome back Hi, to Jay. Think Tech. It's good to be here. You look good. Uh, um, I just want to point out I'm wearing my Washington Nationals shirt tonight because the Washington Nationals are headed to the World Series. Well, we don't know yet, but they're in the playoffs. <laughs> well, we're going to try to show the logo as the show goes forward. Yeah. <laughs> Give you full credit. <laughs> it's so, my second favorite logo after the uh, after the University of Hawaii. Okay, so <laughs> we want now that too. we want uh, that too. Okay, well, so uh, the, the news then, I, and I understand you came back from a trip recently uh, to Canada, you at the courtesy uh, Canadian government, uh, to see some installations and have some discussions in Canada. Can you tell us about the trip and um, where it went, what it did, and what you learned? Yeah, so I think that it was an interesting trip. The government of Canada occasionally uh, sponsors some visits to their energy facilities. And myself, along with uh, uh, senior people from the Institute of Energy Research, Heritage Foundation, someone from the State Department, the Department of Energy, mm -hmm. and uh, the Brookings Institution, were all guests of the Canadian government. And we visited Manitoba, we visited Saskatchewan, and, and uh, also Alberta, including the uh, infamous or famous... Uh, uh, you know, heavy oil fields in uh, Fort McMurray. Uh -huh. uh, we did there. see what trip. was quite interesting to me, one of only two fully functioning carbon capture and storage facilities in the world. Mm -hmm. And I was impressed with the, this was at Saks Power in, uh, in uh, Regina, uh, Saskatchewan. And uh, I think the thing that struck me most about that visit was basically you have a power plant in which somebody installed on the end of it a chemical plant and that the skill set to run a chemical plant is much different than the skill set to run a power plant but this facility tries to capture the co2 and either store it deep underground or transmit it by pipeline some 70 miles to uh, an oil company, which uses it for enhanced oil recovery. Uh -huh. So what, I, what's, the, what's the benefit of connecting an, an, an energy facility with a chemical facility? Uh, how do they, how do they uh, synergize? I think that one of the problem, that's one of the problems if we're going to make carbon capture and storage uh, successful, is we're going to have to have a more sophisticated uh, skill set uh, because it is the power plants that generate the CO2, of course. Mm -hmm. And the, the long-held uh, concern, let's say, of the coal producers and the coal people that use coal in power plants is that if we could just somehow capture and store this carbon, we could, we could, this industry could survive, right? Mm -hmm. Because it could be a zero emitter. Because mm -hmm. it could literally store all the carbon deep under the earth. You know? What 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 use would the carbon play if it's stored under the earth? I mean, you, we're just keeping it out of circulation. Is that the idea, exactly, or we use it in some exactly. way? Exactly. Okay. And it, at, at that stage, when you put it down under so much pressure, it is in fact a liquid. And we do know that uh, there has been a lot of debate on this, a lot of concern on liability. What happens if the storage facility has a big burp and emits all the carbon at once into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I actually think the real issue with carbon capture and storage is not the integrity of the underground storage, but the cost. Mm -hmm. Can it be done in a cost-effective manner? Is it costing $100 a ton or $10 a ton? Yeah. And I can, no one ever wants to tell you what that number is. I think largely because they just don't know yet. Yes. Well, so how do you store carbon underground? Just pump it into the soil? You put a pipe no, no, down? You, do you find a geologic structure, uh, maybe an old oil well or a geologic structure, or you drill a well deep, 
maybe 10,000 feet and you find a geological structure which is stable and which can store it and uh, accept it in a way where it doesn't, uh, it doesn't release it. When you say it's an acceptable... I mean, if you think, you now we are quite good at drilling very deep holes. Sure. Uh, you can think about a great deal of CO... For tens of years, I think, for decades, uh, in places where it makes sense. Uh, oil drillers have used CO2 to produce oil, mm -hmm. to give them enhanced oil recovery, mm -hmm. and the CO2 has, in fact, remained behind. Mm -hmm. Well, so I guess my question is, how can you be sure... That, uh, that that geological structure is going to contain the carbon and that, uh, and that the carbon will not leak out into in, into the uh, you know into the earth and somehow affect uh, um, you know the environment or, or agriculture uh, you or can't just be come right up into the air certain on any technology but I think the it's like Yucca Mountain in Nevada where we store the nuclear uh, material we'd well, like to store the nuclear material but uh, Former majority leader Harry Reid prevented us from doing that. But I mean, uh, the I think the consensus really is is that this is a stable way to store it. Mm -hmm. The real issue is how cost effective is it. Yes. Well, looking at the whole trip that you had in Canada, I guess it was mostly sort of toward the western end of Canada uh, yeah. and maybe points north. Uh, what was your sense of how uh, the Can the Canadians? Uh, view um, oil, how they view fossil fuels, how they view energy, and is it different from, you know, regulatorily uh, or otherwise, yeah. or maybe consumer-wise? So I, I think the most interesting thing about Canada today is they have proceeded with a nationwide carbon tax. But since none of the provinces trust any of the other provinces, all the taxation and revenue from the carbon tax stays within the province. Mm -hmm. So they have a, a carbon tax that is going to go, is now around $10 a ton, that will rise over time to, like, by 2040, to $50 a ton. Think about that, that's roughly equivalent to 50 cents a gallon, for mm -hmm. those of you that still drive an internal combustion engine. Mm -hmm. well, so it's not a trivial time. amount. Yeah. So and their biggest concern is since virtually all Canadian energy is shipped to the U.S., mm -hmm. what does it do to their competitive position? Yes. Yes, well, they're dependent on the Canada U.S., is, aren't they? The U.S. is their biggest market, and they're, the, they're always concerned. It's concern. virtually their only market. Yeah, oh, interesting, interesting. And actually, the interesting thing, what I told the Canadians, because 83% uh, of Canadian power generation is non emitting it's either hydroelectric power or it's uh, nuclear power. So I told the Canadians, actually, I don't even know why you went to the Paris meetings. You should have just asked them to send you a check. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so, you know, <laughs> so you must have spent a week or two doing this in Western Canada. And, I, and I'm sure there were moments, there were aha moments for you. <laughs> Where you observed and learned and heard things that were, you know you didn't know and uh, that you could take back, and I wonder if you can tell us what those things were. At least some of them were. What what so, were the aha moments, Lou, in Canada? Well, the best aha moment with Canada is they're just not they don't have as many unreasonable people as we do. <laughs> <laughs> that is the only real takeaway. That's Canada. that's been so for a long time. <laughs> yes, they they. They don't really have the extremes on either end. They try to always work things out, you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in a way, this is a grand bargain because in order for the Albertans to get the other provinces to agree to uh, allow installation of their pipelines, uh, they have agreed to go along with this environmental measure uh, for a carbon tax. Mm -hmm. So I think that that, and, and the other... The other thing about that you really struck by the Canadians, I think, is that their energy technology is really first rate, and it's very sophisticated. And uh, it's a, it's a real. It's a, of course, they people from around the world come and visit this uh, carbon capture and storage knowledge center because it's a, it's a working uh, uh, cap storage capture uh, facility mm -hmm. in uh, Regina. So what, what can we learn from the Canadians? I mean, is there something that strikes you which you saw that, uh, you know, they have, we don't have, 
and that we can use either way of technology or a systems approach or a regulatory approach. Uh, what can we learn? What should we adopt here from what you learned there? I think there's a couple of things. One is the, um, if you look at the traditional way, the first thing is that they have really done a great job in pioneering kind of much more friendly um, environmental extraction technology. Mm. If you remember, oil sands are largely produced by mining, removing the overburden, and then taking the just a few feet below the surface, you know, up, up in the oil, up in the boreal forest, crushing and, and uh, mixing it with water and solvents and extracting the uh, the crude oil this, mm -hmm. from the bitumen. Mm -hmm. But the new facilities now use no mining technique at all. They uh, drill a, a, a pipe. Uh, you know, maybe 5,000 feet, maybe a mile long, and they drill a second pipe. The first pipe, they pump down very hot steam. The second pipe is just through gravity uh, and a lot of small holes, takes the bit bitumen and is pumped to the surface. Mm -hmm. So that is a quite innovative technology, which is just long term, we will not be mining uh, bitumen in the boreal forest anymore. And I think that's a lesson, you know, all in the few parts of the world where they have these kind of heavy oil deposits mm -hmm. that, that uh, everyone can benefit from. So it, it, do we have the same kind of topography? Are our resources uh, similar to theirs? Uh, no, that that's very that technology interesting help because us? the Canadian, uh, they are going to be, they're producing in Canada about 4 million barrels a day. I think next year they'll probably increase their exports to the U.S. by 300,000 barrels a day. Around 2.9 to 3 million is from this heavy oil, this mining, uh, you know, mining in situ process. The U.S. shale oil uh, geologic, uh, you know, formations are actually quite the opposite. They're light oil. They're totally accessed by deep drilling and horizontal and the fractionating the shale rock to get it up through high pressure water. Mm -hmm. Com completely different process. Mm -hmm. And all the Canadian oil is produced on what we call crown property, that is the government's property. In the U.S., most shale oil and gas is produced on private property. Mm -hmm. So with that, you know, I recall um, there's something called the Athabasca tar sands in Alberta. Uh, this is exactly what we're talking about. Yeah, okay. So that's it. But we don't have tar sands, or do we? We don't have country? it. You know who else has these, though? Are the Venezuelans. Ah, interesting. interesting. But the Orinoco Basin, but the Venezuelans are uh, kind of a basket case right now. <laughs> <laughs> they have their own issues. So let's, they have a lot of problems. Let's, yeah, their own problems. Let's shift gears for a minute to uh, Secretary Perry's uh, new uh, uh, directive, uh, yeah. where he, uh, he's talking about uh, trying to do what, what appears to be a progressive thing to create incentives and disincentives around sustainability about um, re resilience, if you will, of uh, power development and transmission. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so I think there is a, you know, in the sort of political wars of Washington, <laughs> there is a sense that a lot of renewable technologies, wind, solar, perhaps, uh, uh, you know, some of the more exotic uh, uh, approaches, that these are inherently intermittent. The wind doesn't operate when you don't get wind power when the wind doesn't blow. Uh, you don't get solar power when it's nighttime. So, but the way power is developed and purchased and charged for does not have a tag on it that says, oh, this power is a little more valuable because it's very resilient. And I know it's going to be there in good times and bad. Mm -hmm. And this power, which I'm dispatching today for almost nothing because uh, the government paid for the wind and solar and the, the marginal cost of, sh of transmitting this power is very low mm -hmm. in pennies, whatever it is, that that doesn't really include in that cost the fact that that power is intermittent. So how should the, and in the U.S., many parts of the U.S., almost all parts of the U.S., has a merchant on market based system for determining how to dispatch power. 
And it's when you dispatch power that you you can decide how, which determines how much revenue you get. Mm -hmm. So if you built a, po a power plant or you built a uh, wind facility, right, you get paid, right, you get paid on whatever the market rate is at that moment in time. It's quite interesting, you know. People have like cogeneration facilities. I saw this in Canada. They are convinced that they they will bid zero, even though which means that the regional transmission uh, operator or the independent transmission operator can keep drawing power from them even if the established market rate is zero. Mm -hmm. Some people do that just to so, just so that they can be attached yeah, to the that's grid. That's pretty swell. I and mean, if you can store it, you're in great shape, huh? If you can store it, but of course, cogen is flowing from the gas and stuff. So here, here's the interesting thing about this. I, I think the proposal has received a lot of criticism enormous amount of criticism because they haven't just spent enough time on it yet. Yeah. But I think the idea that some power is more valuable than other power because it is more resilient is actually something that we need to think about. Yes. Particularly after we've had these big storms. Yes. Yes. So my question is, you know, okay, so he raises what could be a progressive argument or a possibility. And yes, yeah. they'll, you know, I think the environmentalists back. would call it very unprogressive, but I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, chances are it would punish wind and solar and give more credit to a facility like a nuclear facility mm -hmm. or a coal facility because they have power stored on site. Yes, and, and dispatchable. Dispatchable, right. Yeah. So I guess, uh, okay, it's a nice idea, but how, if at all, does uh, Secretary Perry actually intend to implement this? I mean, what, oh, what, what is his yeah. so program? So what he does is, we have something in the US, United States called the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And that commission is in charge with all kind of public monopolies or the inherent regulatory authority to address public monopolies which are involved in the, or, you know, that are maybe inherently monopolistic in the transmission and production of electric power, natural gas pipelines, and uh, energy, but these kinds of energy resources. And the commissioners at FERC have a very large staff, mm -hmm. and they, they essentially set the rules of the road. You know, What can you charge if you build a common carrier pipeline? How should the regional transmission operator or the independent transmission operator be organized to dispatch power. What are the rules he can use and what are the rules he cannot use? So they have so to weigh in on this. he issued a notice of proposed rulemaking, yes. which kind of set out the idea, but didn't really tell them exactly what he wanted them to do. Yes. So we're going to have pushback. We're going to have the stakeholders weighing in. We're going to have a, a conversation in Washington and potentially nationally. Uh, and that means, Lou, that you and me, we have to follow the story, especially you, uh, and check back in on it and see where this all goes, because it could be yes, a yes, very yes. positive change. Anyway, yeah, let's take a short the, break. The Lou. recent uh, hurricane did show us. But, uh, yeah, we're going to we, call. We're going to discuss that right after this break. This is Energy in America. That's Lou Pugliarisi of EPRINC, uh, the Energy Policy Research Foundation in Washington D.C. Joining us by Skype. We're going to take a short break and come back, and we're going to talk about what happened with energy in Puerto Rico and how we can fix it. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Oh, good afternoon. My name is Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, a program on Think Tech Hawaii. We show at 3 o'clock in the afternoon every other Monday. My guests are specialists both from here and the mainland on energy efficiency, which means you do more for less electricity and you're generally safer and more comfortable while you're keeping dollars in your pocket. Guys, don't forget to check me out right here, the Prince of Investing. I'm your host, Prince Dykes. Each and every Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Hawaii time, I'm going to be right here. Stop by here from some of the best investment minds across the globe in real estate, finances, stocks, hedge funds managers, all of that great stuff. Thank you.
You guessed it. We're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii, and we're doing Energy in America with Lou Pugliarisi of EPRINC in Washington, D.C. by Skype. Lou, uh, you mentioned before the break, and I'd like to cover it now, uh, this whole issue about energy in Puerto Rico. And we know that Puerto Rico was really devastated. It hasn't recovered yet. Most of the island has no power at all. This is a serious problem. Could happen elsewhere, too. And it will, I suppose, when extreme storms hit other cities in the country. Um, but I just wonder what your thoughts are and your comments are about what happened in Puerto Rico to the grid, to the distrib distribution of power, and what needs to be done. What are we learning from all that? So why don't you tell us the story of energy in as Puerto Rico? you know, if you hold a Puerto Rican bond, as I do, <laughs> that uh, the Puerto Rican electric utility is a bankrupt. Oh, and that's nice. <laughs> they have failed to make a lot of investments and they're regulated in a very let's say counterproductive way over the years mm -hmm. and uh, so one of the so this storm could not have hit in terms of u.s states and territory a worse site or a more vulnerable site in the whole continental u.s and its territory i just can't imagine Puerto Rico would be the last place we want a storm to hit. Yeah. It has high, it's underinvested in uh, reliability of its grid. Its grid is old. It's outdated. And the storm wrecked havoc through the whole island. Right? So I think... Uh, on top of all the other problems they've the had... The whole grid was wiped out. On top of all the other problems they've had, as I recall, exactly, there's $70 exactly. billion dollars underwater in Puerto Rico. They can't pay their bonds on anything. And they yes. haven't been bailed out just yet. So now, on top of all of that, we get the storm. <laughs> and I do think that, you know, uh, sort of the, for our friends in, on the Hawaiian Islands, the Puerto Rico is a good object lesson. Yeah. That we might not like making these investments in our grid. We might not like making the investments in our power sector. But when you lose power, and you can't bring back quickly. It's devastating. They have dialysis units in Puerto Rico that could not get enough diesel fuel to keep running. Wow. Uh, I think the death count is maybe up to 100 now. Wow. And I, I do really think in many ways it's not just technology. It's very the dysfunctional politics of Puerto Rico where, you know, we don't like to tell the public, oh, this is painful, but we have to. We have to pay for these things. We have to build out our grid. We have to put some resiliency in the system. Now, uh, lots of people would like to blame this on renewables, but I did some checking. Only 2% of the power in Puerto Rico were renewable. Mm. And they were um, completely wiped out in the storm, of course. As you know, most windmills shut down when the wind gets above 55 miles per hour, mm -hmm. uh, they get engaged. And at, her, and at hurricane strength, most windmills suffer enormous uh, structural damage. Sure. I mean, if you, if you I, I'm not sure what shut down means, but if they lock the blade at 55, um, you can see the blade being torn away. If they don't lock the blade at 55, you can see it spinning out of control. Either yeah, way, yeah, it's a problem. They, they're trying to have ways for it to lean into the storm, do all these other things, but yeah. you're right. It can be very high speeds. And I think this gets back, sort of, if you're looking for a connection back to the Perry Initiative, mm -hmm. which is, okay, we need, you know, there, there is, renewables can be quite cost effective, right? Yeah. They can be non emitting. Yeah. And so they need to be, uh, we need to look at, we, we, we certainly should not discourage them. But we need to find a way to, you know, as we move forward, to not be so reliant that we're increasing our vulnerability. We need to think about the resiliency. And this gets back to an old story we've talked about many times. We haven't figured out how to store the power yet. Right. You can store the power, it changes everything. Yes. We haven't figured that out yet. Well, it strikes me that uh, you know, Puerto Rico has lost so much. It's lost the, it's all its infrastructure, really. It's lost uh, so many residences and businesses. The uh, number of people leaving every day is in the thousands, trying to you know, find a home somewhere else. And that's probably a one-way trip because it's going to take a long time to rebuild Puerto Rico. 
And so what you have in, you know, in, in some ways is a complete devastation, a bankruptcy at every level. Uh, and another, way, another, another thing, though, another approach to that is it's an opportunity to, to rebuild and rebuild better. So if I give you uh, the I, job, I agree. Lou, and I, agree. And I, I mean, I think there has been some criticism of the recovery effort and the role of the Federal Energy Management Administration, or what we call FEMA here in Washington. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think that FEMA didn't, did a pretty good job in Texas and Florida. They were well positioned. They had, uh, a, a, you know, good. You know, they were able to draw upon a, an able and skilled workforce. They had logistics worked out, and I think the Puerto Ricans suffered. It's quite interesting. I believe that uh, if you saw the full page ads in the Wall Street Journal about the paper, where the Maritime Union wanted everyone to know they were supplying Puerto Rico, but in fact. Uh, we only lifted the Jones Act for Puerto Rico for 10 days. We probably should lift it for a year. Yeah. In other words, we should help them any way we can. And if one way we can help them is open up the whole island to worldwide shipping and the cheapest possible transportation through the maritime services, well, that, that's definitely something we should do. I think that, that is one of the, the, one of the issues. Well, that's Hawaii is very interested in the Jones Act, and what happens with the Jones Act in Puerto Rico will be instructive to us here because we could have the same kind of uh, exactly. experience. But let me ask you this. I mean, I, I'd like to put you in charge. I'd like you to make, you know, be in charge of Puerto Rico now, or at least the energy part <laughs> of it. And I'll fly you down there just the way, you know, you flew to Canada. And I put you on the ground in San Juan. And here you, you'll find this, you know, desolate landscape with everything flattened and no, no power in most places on that island. Where do you begin? What do you do? How do you build or rebuild? And what special considerations would you entertain in order to rebuild it in a way so that it's not susceptible to further storms? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think there's going to have to be a lot of study on that. But clearly you want, uh, you're going to have to do a lot more work on how you distribute the power. You're going to have, the Puerto Ricans are going to have, need stable, dispatchable, baseload power. Um, they're, they're just going to have to make this investment across the board. And that's unfortunately going to take money. And I think some of that money is going to come from you and me. I'm, I'm sure, because they don't have it down there. And they if that place is there. to survive and, at all. Um, and they, and they, but you know, that, there's a lot more problems in Puerto Rico than just the power sector, the tax structure, the, uh, Unfortunately, they borrowed a great deal of money when they weren't able to, uh, for operations instead of investment. And uh, the place is a basket case. It's going to have to have massive uh, economic reform. Yeah, and speaking of economic reform, I mean, this is kind of unprecedented because you have an island who had a, which had a, a really soft economy to begin with, you know, failing economy, if you will. Now people are leaving. Uh, the, you know, the structures and infrastructure of the island are in terrible shape. It's going to require a lot of money. I, I, I don't think that throwing uh, paper towels out to a crowd is, is going to help very much. At this point, it, <laughs> it, it requires cash money from the United States, from you and well, me. Not clear that Congress is going to provide that money. Not clear there's anybody out there, Jones Act or no Jones Act, that's actually going to provide supplies and, and cash and you know, all the things you need to rebuild from, from the ground up. And so we have, we have the possibility of an unprecedented failure of a territory economically happening yeah, right on I, our I watch. I actually think this is a, I actually believe the Congress will step in, that they might, who knows, perhaps the island will have to be, the whole island will have to be put under some kind of control board, going to have to change its investment rule. I think they need to give it, it might have to be given special tax treatment, but they're going to have to do something yeah. to change the whole attitude towards investment, uh, stability of the workforce. I, I think this is a very serious problem. I yes. agree with you. And, and I, I don't think, think there's an easy answer. This is important to Hawaii to watch what's going on because yeah, we are I, likewise I an think, island state. You, you know, yeah. Given the sort of nature of the, both the isolation and the, and the way power and uh, economies of these uh, islands work. And Puerto Rico is a much bigger piece of territory than Oahu or yeah. Kauai, but it's still something to keep an eye on. Yeah. 
And we will, Lou, you and me, we will we'll talk about this again. We'll follow through on all these threads. And I will see you again in two weeks. I'm looking forward to that as always. Lou Pugliarisi, the CEO of ePrink, who joins us from Washington, D.C. by Skype. Thank yeah. you so much, Lou. It's always fun. Okay. Thanks, Jay. Aloha. <laughs>